I got to watch highlights of you yesterday. Um, I think if you put a, a stick and skates in your hands, you'd be a pretty uh, pretty good hockey player. You weren't afraid to take the body. <laughs> no, and I, you know, as a kid growing up in Green Bay, you know, we grew up tackling each other. You know what I mean? The Packers were my were my big thing growing up, and my other role models that I played with. And so it's funny. I know Brett Favre is not in the media for very good things these days, but when growing up in Green Bay, you know, no one personified toughness, having fun out there. Mm-hmm. You know, being a good guy, like that kind of stuff in the community. I think you know that's where I grew up in Green Bay, having Brett Favre and his toughness as kind of my example as, as I became an athlete uh, as an older person. Uh, we should introduce you to the audience, Jay Demerit. Uh, you, yeah. you're the you're the first player the Whitecaps signed, right? Is that right? Yeah, I was the first signing captain of the, of the franchise when we came into the league in, in, in 2011. So the MLS was was um, you know adding new teams back in 2011. So we were an expansion franchise. The Whitecaps, of course, were one of the first teams in North America back in 1974 when the North American Soccer League was started. So the Vancouver culture was always here. The soccer culture is, is as long as anybody in, in North America. And so for me to come back from Europe where I was playing and, and really get offered a really unique and rare opportunity as you do in modern day sports, you know, to be the first signing of a franchise in 2011, like that doesn't really exist. And so from a leadership perspective, that was that was really my choice to come back and why I wanted to you know, continue my career and, and, and do it on, on North American shores because anyone that knows my story knows that I, I, I moved over to England with nothing but a backpack and a dream. And, and it's kind of, I, I did it in opposite, in mm. opposite directions. How do, how do you guys know each other? We met through uh, a mutual friend, Philly Murphy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Philly uh, works with O'Neill's and uh, Jay does some stuff uh, for O'Neill's as well. So uh, we met here actually in Smiths of Gastown. Oh yeah, over, over a pint of Guinness. <laughs> I'm a Gaston guy. I live across the street. Oh, okay. So before I even went, really, I well, I used to be in here and doing doing my thing. So uh, it's nice to meet the team over the years, and then obviously seeing the face behind the brand over the last couple of years is uh, is really fun for me. And I, you know, I, I've known for a long time, not only living in Europe, but uh, you know, I've never met an Irishman I didn't like. So you know, here we are. <laughs> really, not one. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what time of the night it is, yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and we actually uh, we know the same people in Chicago. It's such a small world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we when we met, we were talking for five minutes, and Jay mentioned where he was from, and we talked a bit about uh, our stories, and uh, we ended up knowing some of the same people. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, and we've done a lot of stuff uh, together since that. Uh, Jay has been a guest speaker for us at Terminal City Club and and other events like that. So yeah, and I want to get into some of the you working with youth, the public speaking, and that. Um, I got to ask. A, I want to go back to the the, the Premier League. Um, again, you you scored the that would technically be the winning goal, right? It was a three nothing win to get yeah. get your team to the Premier League from Championship. Yeah. Uh, walk us through that that game. Actually, I saw you in a clip. You said um, you were sitting on. I think it was that game. You were sitting there smiling um, because you knew you deserve to be there. Yeah, and that that's the line in the TED Talk where I start this TED Talk. Yeah, um, that's which right. I spoke at the Vancouver TED here, but um it was kind of like when you get to those big moments. You know, a lot of people didn't they didn't know my story, but when I moved to England as I was a 23-year-old American, I, I had a design degree in my pocket. I went to school, I played D1 college soccer, but I didn't get drafted. And so I was sitting there with a degree in my pocket going, "Okay, what do I do with my life? Am I good enough?" My my own country, America, hadn't even picked me. Like, how am I going to go make it in the UK? But I had a friend of mine that was from London. He said, just come live with my mom. You can stay in the attic and we'll, we'll figure it out. So I was playing in the ninth division, making 60 bucks in an envelope under a pseudo name. Like, that's where I started. So really? on the bench of a Sunday league team. You know, I started there as a 23-year-old American. But then, you know, to go forward, just three years after that, you know, again, I make Watford first division team by the end of that second season. By the end of my first season at Watford, I played 30 games and then got us promoted in the playoff final. The, the, the biggest game and in, in, in most lucrative game in all of sports is, is is the game that gets the team promoted to the Premier League because the yeah. shift of money from the Premier League down to the TV is like now over $100 million to the, to the winner. And so in one single moment, your your lives can change forever. Players don't really get a ton of that money, but the club does. And then players' contracts get, right. get underneath that. And so, you know, when I stood on that line... You know, a lot of people don't pay attention to your stories. You just see a new player on the line and, and maybe a number that they haven't seen or a story that they that may have heard a little bit about. But, you know, for me, I was standing on that line really smiling and going, wow, I've really come a long way just in two and a half years. But that yet, yeah, why aren't we looking at the other side of that opportunity instead of saying, I'm happy to be here. Let's break through that and I'll be a Premier League player because I know my life's mm-hmm. going to change if I break through this moment 
So let's not be unhappy to be here. Let's make the most of this moment and, and, and really concentrate on making the most of that. And that's what that pre- playoff final was for me. You know, it had been years of preparation to get to that moment. But then what do you do at that moment? Do you make the most of it? Have you been thinking about how to crush that moment? Or how do you think, are you, are you really happy to be there and now you're scared of what's going to happen next? Like, that's a mindset shift of how you go and focus in these big opportunities. And any human anywhere is going to get opportunities in their life. They're going to be few. And, and there's not going to be many, and, you, and especially depending on where you're going. But when you get those opportunities in life, you got to have a mindset to take them. Well, because you pick a lane. Them. Yeah, if you pick a lane, you, there's yeah, like you said, there's only so many opportunities within that specific lane. And if you keep jumping lanes, well, now you're going to nowhere. So in that sense, but do you think do you think that is what separates someone that has reached your level and worked for that level? Um, is that that is the deserving to be there. Cause I've seen it quite a bit where, and I've even done it myself where you're, you're almost apologizing for being good mm-hmm. at something. You see yeah. it a lot and it's, it's a dangerous move. A hundred, hundred percent. And yes, to, to answer your question, that, that is a big difference. You know, the best players I've ever played with and against are ones that are masters of the mind. You know, when you can prepare for a moment, you can easily go to the other side. You can be in a fan's view. You can think about what if I mess up? You can think about, you know, a billion eyeballs watching. Mm-hmm. If you start thinking mm-hmm. about, you know, a World Cup, you know, playing in front of billions of people, you know, we call it the weight of the eyeballs. Like the weight of the eyeballs is different depending on where you are, depending on what stadium you're in, depending on who's watching. But, you know, you play in these, these games like the World Cup or in the Premier League when you know billions of eyes are on you. You can feel that weight if you choose to look at it or if you choose to think that that's weight. Instead of saying, look at these eyeballs, I get to be this person that all these people get to cheer for or cheer against. But the fact that you can take that role, and that's the way I I always shifted my mindset, was like, instead of living to that pressure, be that pressure. Deserve that pressure. Because I get to be here. I don't have to be here. I get to. Somebody else chooses me to be in a lineup. Somebody else chooses me to put an armband on my my shoulder, on on, on my arm. So take confidence in that. Don't be scared of these opportunities because everyone else in the stands and the billion eyeballs watching would give their left hand to be sitting in this tunnel, yeah, all ready to walk out in that in, in these moments. Although they so, might not, a lot of people wouldn't though. They wouldn't be willing to go through it. True, yeah. but it also it's if it's if, would, that, if that's the mentality you want, you the player yeah. that you want to be, then that, that, these are the moments you got to thrive in. Yeah, right? not yeah. be the one scared of it. because again, everyone wants to be messy, but how many people get to be? Again, like it's I think it's a, it's always been a choice of, of, of and a deserving of like. You've worked your way to get here. Now be that instead of you worked your way to get here. Now what's going to happen? Am I scared of that? Like yeah. that's two very different mindsets when you walk out of that tunnel. And I made sure that I was always on the, the the first one where I was like, I get to be here. I get to kick Ronaldo. I get to try to challenge that Man United badge, the Mexico badge, the Spanish badge. Yeah. Like going against playing the best, the best players in the world. This is you deserve this moment. Go out there and make the most of it. You know, and that, that was always my mindset instead of trying to again succumb to the weight of the eyeballs right how how good are some of these players so playing against them and that what's the i always actually expand on that the, from championship to premier is um like in, in, in i come from the hockey world so like in junior hockey there's a couple leagues that are actually pretty close they're trying to transferable but then there's the big separation that premier championship when you get into that league is is it a is it a different game it is. I, I would. I would say so. And I say the biggest difference is because you just can't take plays off in the Premier League. You got ninety three minutes, and it, it you can take till ninety two minutes thirty seconds for the Arsenal's, the Chelsea's, the you know the the Manchester United's and those players to like unlock whatever it is that they're waiting for. You know, Ronaldo gets one chance, thirty seconds left, ninety three minutes of doing all the work, <laughs> making sure you're staying with these types of players, which is like tedious, hard concentration work. Yeah. And it's just that's all they need. It's the difference maker between those players. And, and you know, MLS is getting better, but I would say, you know, you look at your generalized squad, 89th minute, player gets chance. How many times out of 10 does that player take that chance? I would say in the, in the MLS, it's probably six or seven good players in the MLS. But I would say in the Premier League, you're talking eights and nines. Like, that's all they need. They need an inch. They need a chance. And it's in the back of the net. And Chelsea wins 1-0. You see it all the time in the Premier League. That's why... That's why it's so hard to stay in that league. That's why relegation is, is, mm. is, is really easy for a lot of teams that haven't found the players that can hit that nine times out of ten. And all the best teams have them. And same with the best countries. That's why you know certain teams only win World Cups because they got those players that can do that. Yeah, do it over and over. Yeah, and for me, like, I mean, one of the stories that I like to tell about my first understanding of understanding what world class is, you know, like the, the, the game happens and the interviews are on. It's like, oh, it's a world class finish by... Steven Gerrard, Gerrard, Thierry Henry, or Mbappe, or whatever. And it's like people always say world-class, but I didn't know that there was a difference. 
you know, like, so I, I remember my first season we at Watford, we were in the championship. So again, the league below, we played against Liverpool in the League Cup semifinal. So it was a home and away. So I got to play against Steven Gerrard in, in my fir- like my first ever season. So I'd come off the park, literally. I'm 23. I'm just trying to be happy to be there. But I'm like trying to figure it out fast because you don't have many chances to make mistakes either at that level. So I'm like, I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm playing against a good player. But then we get to this, we get to play at Anfield. And I remember, you know, Anfield is the lore of almost all stadiums. And so you get to play there in a cup final or semifinal. And that atmosphere is already crazy. You know, I'm used to playing in front of 50 people. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not something that I've, I'm, I'm, I'm scared of, but it's also something that's new to me. Right. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, so playing against guys like Gerard is new to me too. And so I just remember him taking, cause he moved around the midfield a lot. And so he goes and like gets the ball right off his left back. And so he's far away from me. I'm center back. I'm playing left center back. Right. So I'm pretty far away. I'm like 30, 40 yards probably away. And he picks it up, takes one look up, looks back down the ball. And Gerard is very known for these passes, but just hits a frozen rope. Like, three, four feet off the ground. And the thing just goes, same height, all the way past me. And I'm trying to figure out, because his winger is in full sprint, jumps up, takes it down in stride. And you're talking 50, 60 yard ball at that point. And I'd never seen a pass like that before. Like even in the middle of the game, you're like, (laughs) did I just see that? Like that's what world class is. Now I get it. You know what I mean? And so, so you start to see these moments. And for me, it was like, it was, you, you can't sit there and stare because that's when you get yourself in trouble. But I remember sitting there coming off the field on those first Liverpool games going, wow, okay, there's a big difference here. I need to, I need to figure out how I can not play against those guys every week because playing against that guy every week is going to be a really hard task. So like that really set a new level for me. Once I made it pro, you know, you said you get this level, but then you know, so you see what world class is and you see a whole another level. So for me, it was in- inspiring to play against players like that early on in my career because it was like, holy crap, I got a lot of work to do. And in, but in a way, it reset my mindset because it was really easy for me to get comfortable by how far I had come. Now you make a pill, you're playing for Watford, and you were playing in a field with four people. You know what I mean? Like, I could get comfortable here. Mm. You know, but then you all of a sudden you play against those types of players like, like Jared, and you're like, well, okay, I got to get my get, get my stuff back together because I, I got a long ways to go, even and, though I'm here. And how do, you, how do you prepare for that, Jay? Like... When you go to that top level, like what kind of dedication, commitment, what kind of sacrifices do you have to make to play against the best in the world? You've marked Wayne Rooney, Torres, Ronaldo, some of the best players. Yeah, all, all of them. And thankfully, you know, I'm, I'm just really happy I played in this era because now I get to tell my kids that I played against the, you know, the best players almost that I've ever lived. And, you know, Ronaldo, Ronaldo and Messi and those guys are, you know, those guys are on a, le- on a level because of their commitment to the game, because of their commitment to staying healthy, he, you know, like your generalized pro isn't making it 10 years without major injuries. These guys are at like, you know, 20 years uninjured. Like I'm talking like ACLs, Achilles, like things that I, I, I had Achilles and that, that didn't help my career, but like these guys have stayed healthy, but they've stayed at the top of the game. Like when you're at the top of your game, there's X amount of 1% of the world professional soccer world that gets to play that, stay there, play in world cups, you know, make 23 men squads, best, best leagues in the world. But then you get like these guys that stay there for 15 years and they're still winning Ballon d'Ors. They're still winning World Players Tournaments this season. Like it's mind blowing, even from guys that have shared fields with them. But I think, you know, for me, like it's just each of them has a skill set that's unmatched. Like Messi's is his ability to be elusive. I always call it elusive. Like it's his elusiveness isn't anything I've never seen. Like you can't get near him, right? When you think you're there, he's over there, right? When you think you got him, he's, he's behind you and he's touched the ball twice and he's got it again. So you're like, you're just confused the whole time. Mm-hmm. And very few players in this world make me feel like that. I would say probably. There's some great pictures of you and Messi, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, it's probably yeah. like this, and he's, rolling, and he's moving the other direction. <laughs> I think I think the one. <laughs> That's the one I think it is. But, you know, again, I got to play him against when he was 19 in the, in the Copa America in Venezuela in 2007, so a long time ago. He, he was not even wearing the numbers he's wearing. So just seeing the way he moves, and, and, and again, he's also one of those midfielders that gets the ball anywhere. And so you play against Fernando Torres, Wayne Rooney, those guys up front. I know what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. I can match them physically. I can beat the ball. I can beat them in the air. I can match their tenacity and their competitive edge. Yes, they can. They can match that with me, and they can hit it from twenty-five yards out. They could push it past me with pace. But so again, it was more like a grudge match with those types of players. But then you get against the guys like Messi, where you can't even touch him. You can't get near him. You can't affect the play because they just move. If, if you're starting to affect him, they're like, okay, I'm just going to go and stand on the right back now mm-hmm. and like, go get the ball over there. So the, he, the way for he can, the way he can control the game just by being able to go to different positions and grab the ball and create a different environment is, is what makes him so special. And then the Ronaldo's is just athleticism. His athleticism is 
almost unmatched in this game. I always say, like, who's better? They always say, who's better? And I'm like, I think Messi as a complete player is better, but Ronaldo is the best athlete that's ever played the game. Mm. He, he can jump higher, he's faster, he's healthy, you know, like he's stronger. Um, and so he, in a way, he, he'll always beat you to the ball and he'll make, a, he'll make that play. Like we talked about earlier, I talked about the inches. It's all about the inches, gaining an inch. We talk about that a lot in, in when we prepare. It's like, where are the inches we can gain? Where are the little pieces? But he, he's the best in the world at gaining inches because of his athleticism. He can jump that inch higher. He can, he's that half a second faster than you. He's that, his reactional time is, is that half a second before yours. And so that's all the inches he needs. And then he, that he does what he needs to do. And again, his clinical nine times out of 10, eight and a half out of 10 every time. So that's what makes him the best. The, the when you play a guy like Messi, though, um, I'll bring it back into this world of, of business that we're in. This is going to be talking. You know, the, the, the show is literally called the On the West Coast Business Show, um, and you're you're kind of you're always trying to learn, trying to get an edge. When you in the sports world, when you play a guy like Messi, do you come out of that game going? Oh, that's how you do that. That particular move on the line when you're pivoting. Like, do, do you are you able to adopt it, or do or some of the things you do? You just go, okay, I can't touch that. I got to focus on this. That I would say is, is is the best way you can do it. There are certain things we know, and again, like we learn over years on what we're good at and what we're not. You know, and when you get to the highest level, you generally should only be doing what you're really good at. Right, and develop. The best that. teams are built around what you're good at. Mm-hmm. So that's when at the highest level it starts to get really important on how you build a squad, who you bring in, what are the characteristics of that player. And so for me, as I became leaders of teams, captains of teams, um, both in the Premier League and here, that's what we talked about a lot. It's just the characters of the guys. What's their skill set? What are they bringing in? We need a thorn that's fast and can run in behind. Cool. Let's go find that. That's all you do. Mm -hmm. How's a center back? Win the ball in the air. You compete with the best players athletically, win the ball, give it to somebody better than you. Don't pass the ball. Don't get fancy. Just win the ball and give it back. Right. That was my job. That's, yeah. that's what I did at the highest level for the national team and as we got into the Premier League. It wasn't win the ball, take a shot, hit the 40-yard diagonal, look pretty, keep the ball. Not my jam. I was not built into that setup to do that. It was be competitive, find an edge, be a renegade out there, understand people are there, talk the game through, be a communicator, win the ball, give it to somebody better than you. That's my lane. That's all I do. And I mean, that's because, again, that's all I want to do at that level. All you want right. to do is what you're good at. Right. Again, Messi, he's, he's one of those very few that is, has more than one skill set. So that's why he's so hard to beat because he'll, he'll he'll just go into his quiver and find something else. Most players don't have that. Most players have one really good skill set that they bring to that 11, and that's all you do. And the best teams are the ones where all those pieces are fitting for the right reasons. That's why the best managers are the best man managers because they understand how to get to the characters of the people and what they bring to the team. At the highest high, and then that's what you plug into my eleven and to do, and and so that's that's also why it makes the managerial side of the game really important. Yeah, you Jay, you have proved that you're a brilliant leader. Um, is that something you believe that you were born with, or is it something that you learned along the way? I, I'm a big, I, you know, I'm right in the in the down the line of nature versus nurture. You know, again, I think you know I come from a line of coaches and, and teachers, and so I think it was built into me, but it was also built into my experience. I was around coaches. I was around all my dad's teams that were high school athletes from track to football. My mom was a track coach and a volleyball coach. And so my grandma was a track coach. So I was just always around my leaders. My leaders and mentors in this world were always around a bunch of people and talking other day, asking how your day was, asking about curriculums, asking about things like coaching. And, and so for me to fall into that naturally, I think was, was easy, but you also have to like it. And I think mm-hmm. one yeah. thing we, we learn in this life. And one thing I teach in this life is, 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 you can feel whether you are good at things or not. You, you can feel whether you like it or not. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like if I do something and I'm like, did I like that? Mm, I could think about it. But I'm like, did I feel better after that? Did I feel, do I feel lifted up? Do I feel drained? Do I feel annoyed? Do I feel angry? Like whatever that is, I need to know what that feeling, because that's usually the driver, right, of why we should do things. And so for me, leadership was something that always, it fueled me. I would come off a, a field and I would have communicating through, you know, 15 guys in 93 minutes. I'd have a no voice, but I would, I would feel like, if, especially when you win, you feel like you, you've, you've played a part in making sure that, that that crew was led in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And again, that's only letting people do their jobs. Me being in there, being the conduit for all that moment, was, was, it was a huge thing to lift me up and I'd feel better. That. I wouldn't mm-hmm. come off feel and feel drained. Let's do that again. That was fun. Like, good job. And then getting the guys back together. And so for me, I just, it, it was something that through my experience, I ended up wanting more of once I started to do it. 
Because I think we do. We have to try. We do feel something. Did I like that? Yeah, cool. Do it. Now, did you like that again? And really, that's where feedback and this whole kind of idea of like checking in with yourself and then checking in if you are a leader of others, checking in with them too. Hey, boss, did what'd you think? Did you think that that? Do you think the guys are listening to me? Right. Do you know what I mean? Like really checking in on those things. Did I like that? Or do I feel drained? Am I tired? You know, are we? Because I think a lot of times we we go in the mindset of, are we a doubt? And we believe it, even if it's not true, but really having the filter of what the difference is, I think was how you know if you if you like something or not. Yeah, did you, um, did, were you able to see, leadership sometimes, if you're sort of in a bubble, you maybe kind of miss the effect you're having. Did you, did you monitor pretty closely? Because you're, you're playing a game, you're trying to win a game, and you're also doing this dual leadership. Are you, are you able to look at it uh, sort of objectively and see the results? And if, if yes, is there anything that's, is there a moment that stands out where you went, oh, I actually shifted a guy's direction. Maybe he was going this way and I actually got him on the right track. Yeah. I mean, there's moments of a lot of those things, you you know, and and I think part of it and and, and really to your question was, is, is that was experiential. Like when I first started to lead, I got my, I was captain of the team by my third season at Watford and I was an American, you know, in England. Mm. So you, I had to hit a bunch of overcome a bunch of barriers just to get accepted into the room, you know, as an American, you know, like that, that kind of idea was the first hurdle that I get over. And then all of a sudden now I'm leading men. Now I'm leading, not just English men, I'm leading men from Nigeria and Sierra Leone and, and Norway and all of these places, you know what I mean? So culturally you got to get to know the people too. You know, the way I'll talk to somebody from Ireland is different than on some guy from I'll talk to from Florida, hundred percent. Just, be, but again, if I'm not, thankfully, because I was, I was always a communal person. I've always liked people. And so therefore getting to know people was a, was a trait that I always enjoyed. And because again, if you don't know them, you can't lead them. Mm-hmm. You know, and that goes back to the, why the best managers in the world are the best man managers in the world. That's all they do is they manage one on one with a with a team blueprint of what we're all about. Right. But their real managerial skills are the one on one conversations we're having with people, how they put people together in the same room, who are the roommates, how do we create culture? Like that's all management of people. And and, and so within that, because I was around managers of people my, most of my life, because I was around coaches that asked good questions, I was just naturally able to be able to do that. But because I actually felt interested in them because I actually was interested in them, it allowed my job to be easier because I actually did care about them. I actually mm-hmm. did want that role. And I think that allowed me to step into that leadership role maybe a little bit quicker than most. But that being said, I got my captaincy taken away from me my first year at Watford right in the middle of the season. Right as I came, mm-hmm. we, were, we were ready to go to the Premier League, back back to the Premier League. So when we came down um, in 2007, I, I, I got the offer of the captaincy to stay. And so I stayed. Leadership was most important to me. I, what I had earned at that team was, was, you know, again, I had a great rapport with the fans. It was something that I wanted. But then when I started to learn, I was like, oh, I have to do everyone's jobs. I'm the captain now. I put the armband on and I helped. I felt this like over responsibility for everybody. Uh, Instead of losing that, you do what you do. You do your do. I'll help you manage. I'll, we'll help them be managed in between. Right. I was like, I'm going to do your job. Now I'm going to do your job. Now I'm going to show all the fans that I'm a good leader. Right. And what happened was, as we limped into the playoffs that next year to, to to go back up to the Premier League, we had a couple injuries. I was trying too hard, and the coach just pulls me in his office. He's like, "Jay, I think it's a bit too heavy for you right now. You know, the armband's a bit heavy. Like, it feels heavy. Does it feel heavy for you?" I'm like, "No, you know." Again, you're like, "No, I wanted, I want the challenge." Well, it's the thing, but I, it did. It felt heavy for me. Yeah, and and that's you know, for me, that's what I had to learn about leadership is that you can't. The moment you start doing everyone else's job, you are not doing a good job as a leader. It's not, it's, it's the opposite. It's, 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 you are, it's, you're doing your job so you can be the example for others as a foundational trait of why we're here. That's why the leader sound, it stands in foundation. But then it's like, then it's like, how do you actually create this crescendo of all these parts mm. that allow this team to, to flow? And, 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 and that's only me allowing you to do your job. That's not yeah. me doing it for you. And so for me, that's, that's really what I had to learn early on. I started to do everyone's job and my, my, my performances were lacking. Mm, I was missing right. in the 90th minute because I was too busy worrying about what you were doing instead of losing my guy in the line right. of the back post. And so those moments started to happen. And so there's results to most things. And so I did learn that my first year, but then again, I came back preseason with a different attitude, ready to, ready to lead in the way that I knew I could. And I gave, he gave me back. And so then I was wow. happy for another two and a half years after that, before I left. And so we got we got to go through these things. That's quite an honor to get it back to second, like get it get a leadership position like that back. That's quite unique. Yeah, I think so. And again, it was his test. He knew that I was a young leader, and so he, it was yeah. one of his versions to say, "Listen, I'm going to take it away from you and see how you react." Right. And in a way, that was what he needed to see to make sure I was the leader that he thought that I was. 
And so within that, I, I think I, again, I had to go through that experience too. I had to make sure that I learned that trait. You can't do everyone else's job. You can't. So who was the, who was the manager? Uh, Adrian Boyth- Boothroyd. What? He was the pr- manager that got us promoted. Uh, really was my best manager teaching me about myself, really understanding like a group dynamic and how you can set the standard up like a belief in the culture. And so he, he was the first manager that really taught me about those two things. Well, cool. I was going to ask, uh, you said something, it's kind of an intimate thing you said is about the one-on-one discussions from uh, that, that that's about leadership. Um, and I think of, you know, watching guys, you know, yelling in, in front of the team, kind of get everybody pumped up. And there's, of course, there's a place for that. Um, but you you saw managers, um, of the clubs, they're, they're really maximizing those one-on-one discussions. So did you specifically take that and move it into being a captain of your team and really try to have this one-on-one, did you make a point trying to have one-on-one time with the guys? Yeah, I did. And then the manager did that too. And he used to do this thing. And I, and I say, this is one of the cool things about his leadership traits. He used to do this thing. Um, he, after, after every training session, he grabbed one player and, and pick the name out in front of everybody. And then he put his arm around them and then walk them around the field. So it's like, again, how long does it take to walk around the soccer field? I don't know for four minutes, five minutes. And so, but that would be his way to show the group that he was managing one-on-ones doing it in a way where it's not like, Hey man, come into my office. Cause everyone thinks you get in trouble when you're like, Hey, come into my office. Coach wants to see you. They're like, Oh, you know, like, oh, shit, like, what am I doing? Like, oh, did I do something wrong? Did yeah. I get dropped? Like, what's going on? And so even to stop that mental thing that happens, he's like, let's call you in front of them. This is why I do this every day, guys. It's just my check-in with you. And then every day, well, now I'm, like, wanting to get picked. Right. Now I want to actually see the coach because I'm like, oh, it's just a conversation to see what's, where I'm at. Yeah. Cool. And then if we talk about the games, we talk, if I wasn't playing, you'd be like, well, why don't you think you're playing? Like, what, what do you want to do to get back in this team? What kind of mindset do you want to do to get back in? So it really was like an open forum of like making sure a, a private conversation was being had, but with a group of guys, it's like, okay, I understand that this coach cares about us. And so mm-hmm. it really started to set that culture that we we're talking about right. where everyone cares. And then we did this other thing called the circle mentality, which was we would sit in a circle on every Sunday morning for our feedback days. And everyone that had to do with the game day operations would be in that circle. And so that created accountability, that created communication, that created a circle that grew and grew and grew. And by the end of that season is when we got promoted to the Premier League. And so like we attribute, I do a whole speaking engagement around that season about how A.D. Boothright set the culture, how he understood like how to lead us individually, and then how we as a team created a circle mentality that grew with accountability every mm-hmm. week. So by the end of the season, instead of being a team that was being relegated to the third division, we were being promoted to the biggest league on the planet. And again, we wiped Leeds 3-0, smashed them in front of 75,000 people. No one, one, only one team was winning that game from the kick. But that that circle was earned to get to that moment. And was that the key? Like it wasn't, it was, I mean, obviously there a, was a ton of talent on the team and things, but was that the difference, do you think? Do you see I do. It as a difference? If you can see, if you ever watch that game, you can you can even Google it. You can go, it goes to Watford team and we're all jumping up and down, yelling, like oh, in the tunnel. And then it goes to Leeds and they're all like kicking tires and looking down and like just see it there was only one team that was going to win. And it, right. again, if you look at the results in the game, like it showed so much, but and that was one through a million circles that year, yeah. just to get to that point where we are in that moment, making the most of it, yeah. you know, so many circles of like guys having to go at each other, sports psychologists come in and talk about certain things, good, bad, ugly, like everything was so accountable. And you, because in a circle, you can't hide. Right. So if you're telling me that you missed your corner and your mark on Saturday because you know, in the 90th minute, cause you were tired. You think maybe next week, when it's the 92nd minute, you're going to think about that moment of you being accountable yeah. for the 30 guys. It's going to tell you that I'm probably not going to miss my mark right now because mm-hmm. now I find that energy and now I go and do that. And so that yeah. creates that accountability down the line where that circle gets stronger and stronger and stronger. I want to, I want to expand on that a little bit though. Cause that team, you said, you know, they're, they're kind of kicking tires. Your team's pumped up. Could have they been, do you think they had the talent to win? I know it's a bit of a tricky question, but it, do you think they could have? Yeah, or, I mean, the Leeds, the Leeds was supposed to go right back up. They they, right. they had a good squad of really, you know, half Premier League, half half Championship players. Um, and it's funny because Eddie Johnson, who was the other American in that game, he played for Leeds, and I ended up being his roommate that next year because I made the, I, I didn't turn I didn't get my first cap for the U.S. until I was twenty seven, and so like he was already a very much a, a U.S. national team player. That's what brought him to Leeds in the first place, and so I ended up being his roommate like for the, a game in Poland a couple like in the next year. And we were laughing about the game, and he's like, "He's like, man, you guys just received way more effort than us. Yeah, like he would notice him, and so like even when your opponent knows it, then that's even that, that's it's a, over. Yeah, it is it, over exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, I do look to those moments though. Of why? That's always what I think about. Like why? Why were we so jazzed up? Like yeah. what took us to get there? And I think it was just that circle mentality. We trusted each other. We knew that everything 
everything that we, we created in that circle stayed in that circle, you know, no, that circle doesn't break. Everyone's important, you know, and when we sit there and we, we create a, 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 where I get to look at you and tell you things, it's better than me staring at the back of your head, looking at game tape. It's yeah. a very different environment when you right. think about it. And when you right. break it down again deeper, that's what it was, what it did. And there was lots of moments throughout that season that just made that circle stronger and stronger and stronger until in the end, there was only one winner. It's so fun to listen to. I feel left out. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I actually wanted to ask you a question about this, though, because, you, you know, um, I've got we haven't known each other that long, about a year or so, and, uh, you know, done some interviews and that. But um, when you're, you know, when you're around people like Jay and, and hearing about this, you speak, I think you've actually you've had him, you, you've spoken at an event or something. Yeah, 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 he, yeah, he has. What are you taking from it um, in your own? I mean, we're all adults. We're all we're all doing our, our own thing, um, but you're still learning from each other. When you when you hear him talk in other environments or in here, what have you taken from it? Um, look, at, I I really enjoy his company. He's number one. He's a great guy, and uh, I like spending time with good people. Um, and you know, he's done it all before. Uh, I see myself as somewhat of a leader as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I have to be on a daily basis. And um, I think by spending time with the likes of Jay, somebody who has uh, been a leader at the very top level um, in his game, uh, if I can just take small little nuggets from uh, nuggets of, of information from him, um, I think they'll help me along the way. And they have, you know, he, yeah. he's, uh, he's, a, he's a proven leader and um, he continues to lead uh, off the field. Uh, he does a lot for the community. Uh, something that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, he does a lot of uh, public speaking. Um, he he works with uh, Rise and Shine. And uh, what's Rise and Shine? Uh, that's our programs. And so we run music. We have a music festival, which is our fundraiser, and then we run leadership programs for for teenagers. And then now we're making a, a digital learning app, with EA, the big video game company, that's oh, going to cool. gamify learning for teenagers and like help them kind of through a masterclass level of celebrities and brands, tell stories around uh, uh, education and, and cool uh, storytelling vehicles and things like that. But it's, uh, it's where my passions live now. Right. For sure. Well, that, that for you, like, not, that sort of seeing that in the community, that yeah, sort of gives you a, a platform. Back, I think it's very important. Yeah. And, uh, he, you know, I've asked Jay to do a number of events, uh, some on some very short notice, and he never lets me down. Um, so he's a great guy, and, and I, I'm very passionate about giving back and, uh, he he does that a lot, and uh, I appreciate that. Well, I want to, and I want to bring, and the reason I'm bringing in to ask you both this next question is because I, I want to see if there there are two different types of answers. You're in the construction side. I've been in the, I've had a, uh, I've had an exterior company, so I've lived in that world as well. Um, you, you're from the sports world. Um, I know you play a lot of sports, so I'm I'm curious about adoption, getting teams, getting your team on board. And I, I want to wonder, I'm curious about the difference because you're, you're sort of playing for glory mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, you, you're going out and competing against other high, I mean, the highest level and it is for glory. There, there's that element of it. Whereas someone like in construction, you're, you're pounding through and there's this big project that you're going to get to. And I'm wondered, I'm curious how you get, get people to adopt this mindset, this focus and then same same question to you. And I'm curious the two the two answers of how to get your team on board. Well, I mean, I, I think for me it's uh again, it just depends on what the shared goal is. You know, that's that's where it starts, like the intention of why. You know, if it's a if it's a in three months' time we're gonna have this building up and that, that that's then you win. Then in the end that's the win. Yeah, that's you the goal. Celebrate that goal. You know, can you get you get your bonuses in the mail, you get all that stuff, right? Like whatever that is. Um, but for me, for us, it's just a quicker cadence of those moments. We get it every Saturday. Right. And so yeah. like, I think, I think the process is the same, how we look at it as leaders, how teammates look at it as, as a goal, as a shared goal, you know, cause each of those guys will have a, a, a different performance bonus, maybe in their contracts or what, maybe the foreman will get a, a bonus when that, when that building is finished completion, you know, like these types of things, we're all, we can build in little wins, within, within all teams. And, and, and I think that that's, that's the key is finding what the wins will be because mm-hmm. the wins are what the carrots are that drive the work, right? Yeah. If I'm not, if I make an extra grand because I start, I'm going to work at a little bit extra hard every, after every day to make sure that I'm a starter because I know by the end of the season, I'll have a nice little bonus package that I've earned. And then that's going to make me feel good mm-hmm. because when we earn things it makes us feel good. Yeah. And so I think, 
you know, creating that in any team is, is the goal. Like for me, that any even in my Rise of China stuff now, I create leadership programs for kids. But my goal is by the end of that three to four day camp, that kid is going to look at me and say, I've never done any of that before. And thank you. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm trying to do. And so if I get that result at the end, then I know I'm doing the right things. Yeah. yeah and I think, Jay, you know, leadership is the same uh, no matter what industry you're in or, you know, whether it be sports or whether it be business. Um, Jay kind of touched on a lot of uh, important leadership qualities there. Open communication, I think, is very important. Um, uh, acknowledging people. Like he said, he's manager, you know, put his hand around the player and walks him around the field and talks to them and let them know I'm here and, you know, let's chat. And uh, uh, it's, it's kind of like a support system. Um, but it's the same in business uh, and for us. You just, you know, talk to people, um, let them know you're there to help them. Uh, we often say, um, lift as you climb, you know, so mm. as you're climbing up the ladder, you know, help the others around you, you know, acknowledge them, let them know you're there to support them. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, even a little clap in the back, uh, you know, say hello to somebody. Good morning. When you go into the office in the morning, you know, good morning. How are you doing? How's your day? Yeah. Uh, small things like that go a long way. Yeah. Acknowledging people. Yeah. What about when you have the bad days though, uh, as a leader is, do you think it's important to also not try to almost put up a facade? Um, to say, oh, every day is you know, every day is the most exciting day of my life because some of them aren't. Yeah, no, I think so. And you, and we need we need people to lead us too. We need our mentors right. as well. And you know, yeah. I call them mentors. You know, like people that can we can be our support system. You know, I yeah. call it. You know, support support is something that is it's it's a it's a much I think it's a very much an undervalued thing. Like again, but if I put my arm around you and I ask you how you are and we actually get into a five minute conversation, that's me supporting you, right? Mm-hmm. That's me supporting your mental health. It's me, me communicating through if you case you need support mm-hmm. and I don't even know, but because we've now created an environment of safety, you can now be, oh, and by the way, I actually coach him. My mom died this yesterday. Yeah. Like sometimes it takes those, those moments of trust, of, of support. And so I think that's another, that's the big one, right? Is how do you show that? How do you gain it? And I think when do you know you need it? And so if I'm feeling alone, if I'm pissed off or about something, or if I just got in a fight with my manager and now I'm like the man out, you know what I mean? Right. Like that's happened before yeah. too. Like you're like, oh, okay, now, well, how would, how do you, how do you get back from that? Or how do you, how do you recommunicate? No, that never happened on a construction site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And keep in camp, you know, with things yeah. go wrong, things go wrong all the time. You can plan all you like, but things change mm-hmm. uh, Yeah, and they change fast and um, things will go wrong and you just have to be able to deal with it. You know, and the day of shouting and screaming, those days are gone. You know, that's yeah. how we used to, we used to do it back in Ireland, back in the day when I done my apprenticeship. It was like you ruled with an iron fist, you know. Oh, it was fun and, sometimes. So, <laughs> sitting and, on a job uh, site and just you, scream at it. You, you just can't do it. You just can't do <laughs> yeah. it anymore because you know yeah, people. You people no, are you, not yeah, even no. the team environment. You got to no, encourage. No, you got to encourage. You got to yeah. You got to uh, talk, I guess, to people with respect. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to respect them, and if you give respect, you get respect. And I think that goes along. I realize that's simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and but but uh, combining it with clear goals. Cause you still need to all be going this, you know, if you, you have an environment, you don't want to get sort of bogged down into, mm-hmm. you know, cause you gotta, you've got to rise above it. Right. And you got to push forward. And that's yeah. sort of this, this balance that you've got to find of like keeping that goal, but also supporting each other. You talk about mental health. Like that's it. It's a, it's a challenge in a leadership role to sort of balance that all that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we've talked a lot about intention and awareness because again, like it's getting employers to lead themselves or getting players to lead themselves. It's a lot of what I talk about right now. I speak in engagement all around self-leadership, mm. unlocking the tools it takes for all your teammates to learn how to lead themselves. So the first one is in, in, is intention. Like, why are you here? Like, what do you want to get out of this season? That's where goal setting lives. That's where vision boards live. That's where, you know, again, why am I stepping into this room? Is it to work at an awesome bar? Cause I like to be social. Cool. Well, if that's my intention. We can live within that. If it's because I, I'm trying to get into med school and I need to make a hundred grand over the next you know year and I got to work nine hours a day. Mm-hmm. Cool. That, yeah. That's cool too. But if we don't know what that is as leaders or, or support systems, then yeah. how are we ever going to push that person to be that and, and keep that accountable within that? And so I think, you know, setting intention is number one. And then once you're intent, now you got to be aware. Now you got to figure out what's going on. Do I like that? Is that person a jerk? Am I good in this environment? Do I actually like working here? If I'm not asking myself those questions while I'm one time, once I'm intentive, right. once I'm in the room, then how am I ever going to actually going to get to the point where I'm confident in that thing or I believe that we can win? Like first, you got to be intent and aware before you could ever know what you need or what you have. Mm-hmm. Once you understand those two things, then we can move together. 
Yeah. Without, um, you know, we just met, um, what all three of us have, I, I know, I mean, you, you change countries, you change countries, I've changed careers and, you know, all, all types of stuff that we go through. Yours is pretty dramatic because you go from playing in these big stadiums, then you come to Vancouver. Um, that's, you know, your first player signed to this team that's going to come to, you know, soccer is coming to Van and, um, and then the retirement part now you're doing public speaking and what has been the what has been the most challenging transition that you've had because we all deal with them i think it's an important thing to touch on you know it's a great question and i think it's just the transition of like trying to redefine yourself right like you can i can redefine myself as a leader but now i have to still create new leadership programs because i don't get to pay get paid to play soccer anymore Mm -hmm. so like that was the redefinition it was like how do you actually use these skills that actually don't apply anymore like I don't get to play out and I don't have a big contract and I get all my money taken out of my contract and I just got to live on the money I make every two weeks. Pretty simple as an athlete, really. Mm-hmm. It is. And so I think for me, that was the biggest thing. How do I manage my finances? How do I manage the money that I had? How do I start businesses? How do I learn about entrepreneurship? And I made a lot of entrepreneurial mistakes because I thought I was smarter than I was, but I actually wasn't a business person. I don't, I was a soccer player. I was a leader of people. So I don't, I didn't know, I don't know how to start companies. I don't know how to create a financial model. I do now, but I, again, that, Six years ago, I had to learn how to do all that stuff and make a bunch of mistakes and feel like a rookie again. And, uh, and that's what I felt like. I made a lot of mistakes. I did a lot of things. I was married. I got, I got, uh, I got divorced. I'm learning how to co-parent into a, you know, a great family that I still co-parent and have a great family with. Mm. So again, but going through all those challenges while you're trying to start a business, while you're trying to make new money, because you don't have to wake up and get paid to play soccer anymore. Right. So that, that for all athletes is the hardest thing. It's like, because it's so easy to get, wake up and get paid to play. So easy. And, and we don't realize how easy it is until you got to go do other things. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so for me that, that was a challenge, but again, it's something I enjoyed because I like other things. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I've learned a lot of other things because I was, you know, I have a degree in design and because I kind of went to school for a lot of things, going back into the workforce wasn't very hard for me. Oh, okay. It was just picking what you do, understanding what skills you have that are truly relevant to where you're at. And I wanted to be a good dad. So I was spending a lot of time with my kid in the meantime. And like, you know, all those things start to take away all your time. Oh God, now I got to go work out and feel healthy. Like, yeah, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not getting paid to do that right now. Right. So I work <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden you're not working out as much or yeah. no, I do. I, I've learned how to kind of get over that stuff. But like a lot of those up and downs when you're up to leave the game. Is, yeah. Is true. What age were you, Jay, when uh, your career? 34. Ended, 34. Yeah. So I was, I was towards the end of my career and I had a double rupture in my left ankle over a nine month period. So I kind of knew that the ball wasn't coming back to me, which is nice. Sometimes when the ball gets put away for you, it, it actually helps. Mm. You know, you're always like the Brett Favre area. Like if you, you think you can make it, you want to do one more year, and right. now you go to a different team and win a championship. And then you're like, you're ruining your legacy from the place you just left. And so like you kind of get in this spin cycle of like, oh, is that the right way I should be doing? And so thankfully I didn't have to go through that. I was able to do that. But it also was like putting the ball away and finding a new transition into something else is difficult. I don't care who you are. Um, your day-to-day changes drastically. Yeah. What's your, what's your, uh, what's your goals now? Just as we're wrapping up the interview, what, how, what are you sort of looking for the last next few years? Uh, I mean, the, the main focus is, is the leadership stuff next to the next generation. We do a lot of mentorship. We just, uh, my partner is a awesome DJ. She plays in the world's biggest festivals, but she's also a master's in sports psychology, played college sports. Um, and so together we started, we started a mentorship program. We, mm. we run our programs in the summer, but now we've actually just started a, an online mentorship program. And so any kid anywhere can log on and athletes and musicians, whatever, we talk to young people, we give them a bl- blueprint to really again, set intentions, understand what they're, where they're coming from, what they want to get out of their goals. And, you know, Danny's by the book and I'm in, in, in experience. You know, I could talk about playing against Ronaldo and the mindset it takes to do that. Just like she can talk about growth mindset and the right. scientific reason of why growth mindset is important to development. Mm-hmm. So we hit it from both sides. And so we just we see the, every summer we see the importance of, of our storytelling and, and the ability to stand in front of these kids and give them a different perspective. And so now we're, we're professionalizing that is, is a way to do that with Rise and Shine. And then the, the last piece is this app. So we're, we're building an app with EA. Hopefully we'll launch by um, school year. Um, but it's gamified learning for young people. So it gives them back like mental health practices. It helps them sharpen skill sets through a digital world, learning from the same celebrities they already follow. But it's educational content. So it's like, this is why I did that. Or this is what it's like to give a team talk. Now I have to set up my phone and give a team talk. I'm a 16-year-old. I've never given a team talk. Right. But I can do it controlled through my device. Because Jay and some other leader just told me how to do it. Now I get to practice it. Now I get to do this little bit of education on something I'm very comfortable in. And yes. I get points for it. And I get to earn a Zoom call with that leader that you that inspired you to go and do it. Now you're creating a circle of learning where everybody's winning. But yet the kid is still developing. 
And so that's really where my passion lives now, like recreating programs of how we develop young young people, not athletes, young people, mm-hmm. and really give them back the, the mental health that they deserve. Because if you ask any young person right now, and I mean like 15s to 25s, if they're stress, suffering from stress and anxiety, 98% of them will say yes. Yeah, and I, I think, yeah. And you drive it, you drive in. I, I always look at people when I'm driving the car, and I, I think that age range goes right up to about 80. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're too hard to fix. <laughs> That's true. In, in, in all honesty, you know, when you get them at 13, you, 14, 15. You can develop this, yeah. Yeah, now we can give them tools to actually practice within, you know, instead of 30 years of training, 30 yeah. years of a mindset, 30 yeah. years of being a part of something that we can't even control. Develop new habits for them. Yeah, we can yeah. help them. We can help them give them a better proof out of self understanding. And so if I understand myself, I create confidence within my being. Now I don't need your criticism. I don't. If I hear it, I just go, okay, the dude's just criticizing me because he probably is mad at himself or his mom. Mm-hmm. Again, we all know them. We all know these people that just they'll, they'll call me a uh, something they've never met me. They don't. You know, yeah. I'm supposed to believe that now, but because I'm 13, I do. Yeah. Because I'm not, I'm not skilled enough in my mindset to understand that that's just noise that somebody yeah. else is trying to project onto me. Yeah. It's not mine. But if I'm 13 and I'm not, I'm not capable of understanding that because now, now I believe it, and now I'm going to carry that, and now I think I'm going to. Uh, you know, not, I'm not going to be healthy in my life because I'm believing something else. And, yeah. and so this is where we got to be at that crux of like understanding, yeah. like give them tools to know, give them practices to understand. Now at 18, they're going to get a job because they're like, actually, I did all the physio lessons and I want to work and I love sports. I don't know. I want to go be a physio for this team in my town. Yeah, That's the pathway we should be providing for a youth development program. Yeah. But if you look at youth development programs now, they're looking for LeBron James to be the basketball player, the next Lionel Messi, so they can all make money. So yeah. the programs can continue to be financially gained instead of some kid that's now gained themselves and can go out into this world with, with con- true confidence to be who they are. Yeah. Like it just doesn't exist in programs right now. One kid gets to win, five kids get the trophy, and 98% of them got to go try to find something else with mental health issues. Right, yeah. And I was thinking, just a thought that came to my mind is that when, um, when, as kids are getting into that, you know, that 13 plus and they're starting to separate from parents, they're, they're going to go under the tutorage of somebody, so you need people like yourself to step in, in in some sort of role to then keep them guided on a good path because it's healthy as, as they go to be adults. You have to become your own person, mm-hmm. but you, you so you're going to be influenced by somebody. So it just when it just well, that's mentorship. mentorship. You know, in mentorship. honesty, that's mentorship. And mentorship in my age is ageless. Like my kid and your kid, they we, they mentor us all the time. But how to be patient or how to like look at something through a different different view. Like mm-hmm. I believe mentorship is ageless, but we have to look for it. We have to want it. Yeah. We have to be it. If we have experience, we should mentor people that want our experience. If we are trying to learn something new, we should ask people that know yeah. how to do that. Like, and so that's what our programs do. Like, I can teach you about soccer and design and leadership and community, but I can't teach you about finance. I can't teach you about writing a business plan. I can't teach you about all that stuff. Like, let the people that are pros yeah. like that do that. And so yeah. if I'm 16, I now have a, a digital device that allows me to go and find that tree of learning through all these celebrities and brands and cool people that I actually already follow anyway. Now I get to learn educational content around how to make a backpack out of a water bottle from Nike. How do you create a rap lyric for this cool song by Drake? You know what I mean? Like, whoa, not only am I getting smarter, I'm actually learning from my heroes I already right. follow anyway, but then I'm getting things for it. I get that unreleased track from Drake. I get a downloadable coupon for that backpack yeah so i'm saving my mom 20 bucks you know i learned about recycling right everybody's winning here Mm -hmm. you know what i mean but are those are those efforts of educational behavior existing right now no kids aren't being heard kids aren't being validated the the institutions are making all the money and half the kids can't even afford to come to school 80 percent of this world can't even afford to pay for education 80 percent yeah you know we talk about hey put out in that 499 app already cutting out 80 percent of the world I know they can't afford four ninety nine a month. So why are we using that for education? Isn't education free? Don't we live in the internet world? Like why can't education be free? So like that's our goal is to create any kid anywhere can learn from celebrities and brands, gamify it, earn cool things, and then create cool content in the middle where it's educational and fun. Nobody's losing here. Any kid anywhere if they have a Wi Fi signal can download it and learn something. Yeah, it's very exciting, Jay. Yeah. Thank you very much cool. for your time. Thank you. Um, I know you've got uh, another place to be, so I'll, I'll wrap up. <laughs> and uh, but but thank you, and, and William, thanks for letting us use this space. Uh, it, it's You're great. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you.